Ben Askren's boxing sparring footage. It's left most combat sports commentators either confused or completely embarrassed at what they're watching. But what does this footage actually tell us about Ben's potential boxing style and strategy against Jake Paul? What actual boxing techniques is he trying to employ here, and will any of them actually work come fight night? That's what we're going to be breaking down today. This is Kiwi MMA, and real quick, if you like this content, then please subscribe to the channel below, and make sure to leave your feedback about Ben's sparring footage in the comments. Okay, let's jump into this. So the first thing I want to note in this sparring session is just how large Ben's sparring partner is here. I'm not exactly sure why he's sparring someone so big given that Jake only weighs maybe 190 pounds and this dude looks like he's pushing upper echelons of 250. But I know Ben's coach Cannon Brunner just stated this in another video. Go six rounds. I really want him to go nine rounds. I really want him to go three rounds with the champ. The two rounds with the three rounds with the champ. And the other champ, which is nine. So I guess the idea is to give Ben a series of different looks, one partner for speed and elusiveness and another for power and weight maybe, but then K9 says this. So I'm putting in the speed first, then we're gonna put the power in. See what I'm saying? So when he's tired, we're going with the big guy. See what I'm saying? Put the weight on him, Arr, sit on him. Yeah, <laughs> K9 boxing, let's go. So they're gonna start Ben with the speed and then put the power guy in afterwards, I guess, to kind of wear and lean on him when he's tired. Interesting take. I mean, maybe they're thinking Jake's going to try to lean on him as well and sit on his punches as the rounds go on, but I can assure you that any version of Jake is going to be way faster and more dangerous than this guy. So yeah, kind of interesting putting him in here with him. But let's get to the actual exchanges. So the session starts off with Ben pawing at his partner, trying to gauge the distance with his lead hand and find his openings. You're going to notice that Ben paws with his lead hand a lot throughout the course of this breakdown. Of course, pawing with the lead hand happens in boxing, but of course it's much more pronounced in MMA where with the small gloves you can really use it to probe for your power hand or hand fight with your opponent if they're in opposite stance. That's basically why Ben's doing it so much here. So he ducks down and throws what looks like a right hook to the body. His sparring partner actually drops his left hand to block the punch, and Ben is able to slip in a sneaky right uppercut here right through the opponent's guard. And Ben's going to land this punch multiple times throughout this session, and as we'll see, it's probably his most effective punch. Now, here Ben has his partner against the ropes who, for whatever reason, seems pretty content to just stay there. Ben is holding his right arm, which is illegal in boxing, but given Ben's MMA and grappling roots, it's no surprise we're going to be seeing him try to push the boundaries of what's legal and what's not, and make this as dirty as possible, so just keep that in mind. He throws a few arm punches here, and let's be honest, there is zero power in these punches, and you can notice Ben isn't turning to these punches whatsoever. Typically in boxing, especially when you throw hooks, you really want to turn into them with your hips and twerk your body into the shot, but as you can see here, Ben is basically in the parallel stance and just winging them out. This is arm punching 101. And of course, at the end, Ben throws in a rabbit punch to the back ahead for good measure, also illegal, but hey, Connor did the same thing against Floyd in their fight, so why not? Now this is Ben's MMA striking coach Duke Rufus who is showing Ben a turn move here. Basically he disengages from the clinch by shifting his body to his right and turning away from Ben's partner. And now what this does is it creates an angle you can use for attack which Duke demonstrates here with a gazelle left hook. Now this is good advice from Duke because Ben, again given his wrestling background, he's going to be using the clinch a lot in this fight and he's going to need some weapons and tools to be able to disengage and then attack from it. So obviously Ben can't just win by clinching up the entire time, so what Duke's saying is, hey, hey, here's a move you can use after you clinch that you can maybe use for a potential attack. Now Ben tries to do the same, and here Ben ducks under this punch from his opponent, pretty much identical to a level change takedown and setup in MMA. Now luckily he won't have to worry about a flying knee here, but he may need to watch out for a counter uppercut from Jake if he keeps doing this. So from the level change, Ben initiates the clinch and is turning the big guy to his left, but then he grabs the back of the head. Classic dirty boxing technique here. Daniel Cormier would be proud, but again, completely illegal in the sport of boxing. Now this could be an effective strategy against Jake Paul, but Ben's going to have to find a way to not grab the back of the head so much because as we saw what happened in the Logan Paul vs. KSI 2 fight when Logan did this, these boxing referees do not take very lightly to dirty boxing techniques. In that scenario, Logan actually had two pole points taken away from him, and it completely changed the trajectory of the fight, so yeah, Ben's going to have to be really careful. So in this scenario, Big Guy throws a very labored cross here, which Ben pulls back on slightly, and again, Ben is able to find the right uppercut this time, shifting his body into the southpaw stance so he can get on the outside of Big Guy's jab with his lead right uppercut. This is actually a punch that Conor McGregor throws a lot, so it's funny to see Ben Askren utilizing it. So Ben has big guy against the ropes here, and again, I don't know what scenario they're training for here. First off, this guy's in a completely defenseless position. He's not guarded up. He's not trying to circle out and escape. He's literally just sitting there in like a fetal position. So Ben's literally holding onto the back of the head here. Again, completely illegal and just trying to throw some pretty weak looking body shots. And I just want to point out, Jake will never allow himself to be in this position, at least on his own accord in the fight. So I'm really not sure why they're training for this. 
I mean, Jacob's solid positional awareness of where he is, and it's shown when he's backed up, he's either going to circle out or try to clinch him and get the fight back to the center. So it's a little weird to allow Ben all this time to work up against the ropes with this guy. So here, Ben is pawing with his lead hand, and he's able to lean away from this labored overhand big guy throws here. And again, he continues to hold the back of his opponent's head, which is illegal. He then goes from throwing a rapid punch to the body to then a right uppercut down the middle, which lands clean. Here we get a little cool combo from Ben. Jab cross, left body shot to rear uppercut down the middle. He likes this combo a lot, I've noticed. In this exchange, Ben feints a jab to the body and then comes up top with a right overhand and then it goes immediately into a clinch. You'll notice that Ben finishes a lot of these combinations off with initiating into the clinch. Again, I think part of the game plan to kind of wear Jake out. And then lastly, the session finishes off with Ben throwing a right overhand, which his opponent guards up, but then Ben sneaks in yet again another lead uppercut. So that was Ben versus the big guy sparring partner. Definitely some interesting exchanges, which I'll talk more on later, but how does Ben fare against someone quicker and more agile? How does he look against someone who resembles Jake Paul in terms of speed and size, perhaps? Let's take a look at this next sparring session to see. So this session, Ben actually spars with three different people. He starts off with the small young kid, then he goes to the big guy, and then he actually finishes off with K9. Let's take a look. So Ben slips to the inside of his partner's jab, which is good to see, and he throws a patented right overhand and then immediately clenches up. He's going to need to be careful slipping on the inside and doing this, though, because Jake may have a counter right hand ready to meet him on the inside if he keeps doing this. So here, Ben's partner guards up, and Ben throws a jab and then a rear right uppercut. He lands both, but what scares me here is how nonchalant and open Ben looks after landing the combo. Now, typically in boxing or just striking in general, you're kind of taught to have an exit strategy whenever you throw a punch or a combination. For example, if you throw, say, a jab cross, after throwing your cross, you would say, duck and slip down under to your right and step out to your right away from the opponent. That way, you're throwing the combination, but then you have an exit strategy to get away out of harm. Now, Ben doesn't really do that throughout the session. Rather, he kind of likes to throw his combinations and then clinch up, almost like the closer he gets, the safer he feels, which can be effective and work from time to time. But if he just nonchalantly walks forward trying to clinch up like this, Jake's going to be all over that. I mean, we saw what Jake did to Nate Robinson when he tried to come forward and clinch, and he was just counter right overhands all day. His partner here just kind of accepts the clinch, but Jake won't do that. If this is Jake, Jake potentially gallops back and then maybe comes back with his own one-two. He maybe plants and digs in for a left hook counter after Ben throws his uppercut. So yeah, this is kind of a scary position to see Ben in here. Here's a good little exchange. Ben slips to the outside of his opponent's jab this time and comes right through the guard with the rear uppercut. In this exchange, Ben launches himself forward again with the right lead uppercut. And again, Ben's not really concerned about form here. It's just if he can land and, and land in any way it's possible, he's going to do it. Now we get to see Ben take a punch here. So Ben is pretty close to his opponent and he's trying to land his right uppercut again. But we see his partner is able to land his jab quickly on the inside. And then he easily evades Ben's right overhand by moving back quickly. Ben then switches back over to the big guy for his sparring session. I'll just mention briefly this exchange here where Ben, again, kind of level changes down to evade this right hand from big guy and that he kind of comes up with his own left overhand, but he kind of comes up down, up, not up, down, which is kind of weird. And then this last exchange here where Ben and his opponent basically just exchange Ben landing the left hook on the inside where his opponent lands the right overhand over the top of Ben's left hook. So then to finish off the sparring session, Ben gets some work in with his coach K9 here. And what I find interesting about this final exchange is that unlike the footage we got from his other sparring partners, where basically they were content to just stay in front of Ben and exchange in the pocket with him, K9 really makes the effort to move around and be much more elusive. You see Ben coming forward, trying to throw some jabs out, and K9 shuffling back and leaning away from Ben's overhand at will. At one point, K9 is able to land the jab on the inside and then L-step away from Ben as he's getting backed up. And I think this exchange is important because I think this is kind of what we're going to see in the fight against Jake. I mean, we saw with Jake versus Gibb, another pressuring fighter who came forward and tried to put the pace on Jake. Jake was, again, moving away, L-stepping, circling out, working his jab, trying to set up for his right hand. And K-9's trying to, I think, get a look there for Ben that his other par partners can't give him. Now, on the other side of the coin, Jake may be content with just staying in front of Ben like his other partners do. Maybe he determines he just has a major power advantage and wants to sit on his shots and really hurt Ben. So if Ben can't hurt Jake in any way, Jake will make the calculation, okay, wait a minute, this guy can't hurt me. Sure, I'll trade with him because I'm going to be the one inflicting more damage. Or he could just possibly let Ben come at him and find his counters using footwork and elusiveness. So that's some of the key moments of this sparring session that Ben has released. And what are the big takeaways here? The first I'd say is that it's very clear Ben is using illegal moves, and he's trying to push the boundaries of the boxing rule set and make this as dirty of a match as it can be. And to some extent, I really can't blame him here. He was only given about two months of training for this match, and to be honest, given his MMA tendencies and his grappling instincts, it's just going to be really hard to meld him into a traditional boxing style in such a short period of time. But how harsh is the referee going to be on Ben? I and mean, this is a very important question. I mean, is he just going to let Ben hold the back of his opponent's head at will? Hold his partner's hands against the ropes? Throw rapid punches after every clinch exchange? 
No, I don't think so, but we know that in boxing, of course, illegal stuff can slip through, and we saw Connor slip in a lot of rabbit punches when he fought Floyd, but I just can't see a scenario where Ben Askren is going to be able to just grab the back of Jake's head at will whenever he wants. Another thing to note here is his style. Ben is basically trying to do the same thing he does in MMA, but for a boxing match, minus the takedown. Plod forward, throw some punches, maybe to set up some clinch exchanges, find the clinch, find his attacks whether before entering the clinch or exiting the clinch, and kind of rinse and repeat. I mean, he's really not looking to counterpunch in the slightest here, and if you notice in almost all these exchanges, Ben is the one moving forward almost every single time. There wasn't even a single scenario where Ben was backed up, which is actually kind of a good sign for him if that's his game plan. Now, in order to make this plan work, his team is kind of banking on the assumption that Ben is going to have better cardio than Jake, but does he really? I mean, Jake has never gone past the second round in a professional bout, and in his first amateur bout against Deji, he did go five rounds, and he did look fairly tired towards the end of the fifth round, so there is that going for them, but there really is no guarantee Ben's cardio is going to be as good as it was for MMA in boxing. It's just a different sport. I mean, Ben's going to have better grappling cardio and wrestling cardio than he does, say, boxing or striking cardio, because that's just more of a specialty. I mean, you could have someone who's really good at one form of cardio, say, kettlebell exercises, and he can do a thousand kettlebell, you know, reps in a row. Does that mean, you know, he's going to be able to be a really good long-distance runner? No, not necessarily. There's different types of cardio for different types of sports. So, it's an interesting game plan. I think it's the right way to go. I just think there's no guarantee that his cardio will necessarily hold up as well as they think it will. And lastly, what skills can be gleaned technically from this footage? Well, as far as shot selection goes, Ben's best punch, as I've been saying, is clearly his uppercut, whether it's the rear uppercut or when he shifts and throws it uh, as a lead uppercut. He's pretty decent at being able to split his opponent's guard with it, throw some strikes on the outside to get his opponent to shield up, and then Ben is able to slip it right through the middle. He did also land a couple overhands and some left hooks, but from what we saw of his striking, his shot selection is pretty limited. He didn't really try to set up much of a jab, rather instead opting just to use his lead hand to probe for his right. Very MMA style. We did see some head movement from Ben, which is encouraging to see, and we notice obviously he likes to duck down, almost like it's a takedown to avoid a lot of punches. And in conclusion, nothing about this footage really surprises me, to be honest. I know a lot of people like to cringe at this footage and make fun of it, but it's kind of what I expected from Ben. And to be honest, this is probably the best we're going to be seeing of Ben going forward. Look, people need to recognize, Ben is a MMA fighter and a wrestler, and there's no way they're going to be able to meld him into this boxer in such a short period of time. So if they're going to have to rely on Ben's sort of unorthodox tendencies here, I can't really blame them, to be honest. It's like if the muscle memory is already ingrained, I mean, Ben's been an athlete and a fighter for so long, a lot of these things he's doing is just built into his muscle memory. So instead of trying to break him down and build him back up, why not just work with what's there? So that's the breakdown, guys, and please subscribe to Kiwi MMA below if you enjoyed the video. And leave your thoughts and comments below about Ben's sparring footage. Is it cringy? Can you see any of the technique or game plan in it? Or is Ben just going to get absolutely smoked? Leave your thoughts below. I'd love to get a good discussion going. For my next video, I'll likely be doing a final breakdown analysis of Ben vs. Jake, just like an ultimate prediction video. And yeah, and thanks so much again for watching, guys. This is Kiwi MMA, over and out.